welcome to the Nerd Party. Hello and welcome to another special Between Takes episode of Missing Frames. I'm your host, Sean Eastridge. We're continuing our 2020 Atlanta Film Festival coverage over here. I spoke with Deepak Sethi, a television writer, comedian, and now a filmmaker about his short film, Coffee Shop Names. So essentially the premise is three Indian co-workers give coffee shop names to baristas because their real names are too difficult to pronounce. But what they do is they imagine the lives that their coffee shop names personas might lead like one of them is a firefighter and another one owns an independent bookshop and randomly breaks into song and dance numbers it's amazing and it's also pretty incredible that this is Deepak's first time in the directing chair so we chat a little bit about the challenges of directing your first film and how it's important to really just be honest with your crew and he was very lucky to be surrounded by really really great talent and they were very supportive, and he was very open to all the ideas, suggestions, and advice they had. We also discussed shooting the different fantasy sequences, which are all just, again, so funny and so creative. And then we talk a little bit more about some future project ideas and other things that Deepak is looking into. So the conversation was an absolute blast. I can't wait to see what he does next, and I hope you enjoy listening. <laughs> Now available to own on video cassette. Well, Deepak, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Uh, I want to say I was looking you up and learning a little bit more about you because, first of all, I loved this movie. I thought it was so funny. And I was like, I want to kind of learn more about Deepak. And uh, you may hate me for this, but I, I stumbled upon the, the heckling video, the infamous heckling video which I think is, uh, is legendary now. Would you call it legendary? I'll call it legendary. I, uh, I was so, uh, during that set, as I was doing the set, I was like, oh, this is a bad set. Like, it's not going well. <laughs> and I said, I really hope something happens. Like, I really- heckler was a good thing. Brain, I did not think it was going to be someone haggling. But I was like, oh, I hope, like, you know, I hope something sort of breaks for me in this set because it's Las Vegas. It was an early show. And sometimes early shows in Las Vegas aren't the greatest because, you know, people are just starting their nights. And, um, but yeah, no, someone heckled me and uh, it turned out to be pretty decent, you know, at the end of that. Uh, it, was, uh, it was a learning experience for all of us and it was fun to. Uh, it's a work of art, that. man. It's a work of art. I encourage anyone <laughs> listening, go yeah. find it. Deepak Sethi, go look it up. It's perfect, but it'll give you good content. I feel like people coming into this, they need some context. They need to know who you are. That's a good introduction to you. But by the way, just on the, the heckling thing, just so that people know, I, I was doing a set and someone yelled and basically insinuated that I was a terrorist. <laughs> and I'm Indian. And I, you know, and, and that was a very, that was the sort of exchange. <laughs> I was like, whoa, what the, you know, so then that, that's basically it. So That's uh, how it all started. Yeah, it's, oh, it's brilliant. But this is this is your first time directing, and like yeah. I just want to know more about your background. You you've been working in television. You worked on shows like Family Guy and stuff like that, and kind of working your way through the industry and working your way and learning the ropes of writing. When did you decide like I want to make a short film? And then how did Coffee Shop Names become that project where you're like, this is let's do this. I think I have been in animation for, I know I've been in animation, uh, writing animation for about 10 years. And I, and I decided that I wanted to do live action because I was really intrigued by breaking out of animation. Not breaking out, so I, love, I love doing it, but it was really kind of intriguing to say, okay, I'm gonna work in live action. And so I said, I, I really wanted to try uh, my hand at directing something I wrote. Um, and this opportunity came along through um, a, a, a basically script house, which is a program that allows you to get funding. And, and I was really fortunate that they picked my script and gave me some uh, money that allowed me to shoot it. And then I got to do it the way that I wanted. It was a dream come true. You know, like once you have a script that you like and a script that you want to direct, you start to hope that things break for it in a way that would work. So we got cast a cast of you know, a first time director having a cast like I had, uh, you learn from your <laughs> your cast. You know, they tell you, you know, you should do this, you should do that. I, I, I was asking them, I said, you know, please give me some uh, information uh, how, to, how to do this. And so, yeah, so I, to, to answer your question, I really was hoping to have a chance at directing. It's not, it's not 
it's not easy, you know, when you're even for someone like myself, I've been working in the industry for 10 years. It's not every day that you get a chance to direct something. So like for us to, you know, for a program like that to come along and allow me to do it. It's amazing. So yeah, I'm, I'm really thankful for that opportunity, but it's hard to, to do. And now you could do it a lot. Like a lot of scrappy filmmakers will, you know, make something for no money. And, you know, I just, I guess I was so comfortable and like that. I didn't really want to do it that way. So, you know, if I'm admitting that, I'd say that's probably why this opportunity was so great. And I, I think like in terms of the script, honestly, because it's so short, but the amount of character and jokes and like just it's so on point and it's rapid fire and you manage to get this really fun engaging story in there with these great punchlines and how did tv writing kind of train you for that because you've done a lot of comedies what is the biggest thing you've taken from that experience when you applied it to the script you were writing first of all thank you for saying that i i think with television writing what happens is you're rewriting constantly right? So you're always rewriting. And, you know, as it moves the episode, each episode moves along the conveyor belt, you're trying your hardest to sort of throw as much jokes as you possibly can without impacting the story structure, which is the hardest part. And I think I did that up until like, I was lucky because, you know, as a director, you get to sort of throw in the lines, like on another take on another take. Then I was also very fortunate that, you know, I had actors who were funny, and they brought their own ad libs, like Karen Sony, who's a a uh, wonderful actor. He, you know, he came prepared with ad libs lines. He was like, oh, "Let me try this." I said, "Yeah, yeah, please do." You know, because the more you get of that in in editing, you go, "Oh, wow, this this could this joke could pop more if I added this." And so, so that was the part of television writing that really helped me out. Now, the part that didn't help me out was in animation. You know, if something isn't working in post, you just draw another. <laughs> You draw another background or you draw, you know, you just go, okay, we're just going to change it. Whereas, you know, you shoot something, it's in the can and you have to use the pieces that you shot and there's no extra stuff to do uh, in, in, in post. So, so for me, television was, um, you know, the learning curve of, okay, now we have this all. So try to make it as funny as possible when you're shooting it. But television writing, you know, in general is so such a strong teacher because you have to let go. You know, you cannot uh, sit there and, and hope for this thing to be the best. And, and one thing you learn in TV writing is sometimes the scripts that you think are the worst are the ones that uh, fans and, and people love the most. And you're like, oh, my God, I thought that was not the best episode at all. And, you know, people do like that. So, so that's another thing you have to do is just go, OK, it's out in the world and hopefully it does what it does. And we'll see what happens if people embrace it or not. I, I guess in terms of the biggest biggest challenges with directing what was the thing that surprised you the most like coming to set and just being like oh my god I was not expecting to have yeah. to deal with this or that or like if it just feels like no matter how prepared you are there's always always something that whether it's like oh we thought it was gonna be Sunday today it's raining or whatever it is the lighting just doesn't work you can't get the right setup what was the the thing that just kind of completely was like oh all right day one I gotta figure this out uh, you know, it's it's funny you say that. I, I got some good advice from very um, well-respected directors and, and people who have, have helped me along the way. And one of the, the pieces of advice that were very common uh, that I was getting was just go with it. Because what will happen is whatever is going on uh, will sort of find its way into the thing. And that's great. And the coffee shop that we use, that was the hardest part. Like, because, you know, the coffee shops don't close. You know, they're always open. And you can't even shoot really late at coffee shops because they open at like six in the morning, something mm -hmm. crazy like that, you know. So it was very hard for us to get a coffee shop. Now, I, was te I teach at a college and in the college, there was a coffee shop. And I said, well, th there's no way they're going to let us. It's, a co it's the whole college thing. And, the right. whole thing. and eventually we ran out of options. And so we just had to ask <laughs> them. And my wonderful producer was just really great at, at asking people for things. And she got them to agree. And so for a long time, we thought, well, we probably don't have a coffee shop to shoot a film that's called Coffee Shop Names. That's a <laughs> bad problem. Uh, but then it was right there. It was just sitting. Just add it, add it in post. Add it in post. <laughs> yeah. That's in the budget. Post. They're at a coffee shop. And then we could just have people with dialogue. Oh, this is a great coffee shop. It's so weird that it doesn't look like one, but it's always like, you know, just constantly just address that. I think, I think that's one thing that was, um, was, you know, I was 
freaking out about a company move because I had felt the guilt of writing too many locations in a uh, seven minute short, you know? And I, I was like, oh my God, how's the company, like the whole, the whole production gonna move? you know, from one place to another in LA. And, and I was freaking out about that. And not freaking out, but just in my mind going like, oh, well, I don't know if that's going to work out because of the traffic here. But, but you know, everything worked out when you, when you surround yourself with uh, very competent and very talented people who are good at their jobs, you start to go, oh, well, they got it. <laughs> yeah. Well, how long did you shoot? Like, how long was the shoot? Because, I mean, you do, you have, I mean, the coffee shop is one location. That's the primary location. Yeah. Um, and you have multiple locate. How long did it take to shoot? Because it's, it's no longer than seven minutes, but I imagine something like that could take up to a week or even longer. It took three days. We, we shot three days. Uh, we oh, did wow. fully at the coffee shop, but then two days we moved because we were doing those sort of imaginations. But, you know, initially in the script, we were burning a house down which immediately you know, had to <laughs> out. And, uh, you asked about TV writing. That's another one, like scratching that out. But yeah, no, I, I mean, you have, you have that. And, and it's such, such a quick thing that you also, you know, it, it's funny to admit this, but at some point, you know, you're going to go, I hope the cameras are recording this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like even the dumbest thing you're going, oh, I hope that you know, I hope this is the record buttons on, you know, like and it's not, always, it's after the fact, it's like, all right, it's a 10 minute Alfonso Cuaron shot. And at the end of it, you're like, cut. Oh, we were rolling. Right. Right. <laughs> and I always say, it's like, you're such a great DP that I don't have to worry about that. But at some level, you know, as humans, you just go, Oh, I hope that, you know, <laughs> it's recording. But you know, I, I was, I was taught to ask dumb questions. And, you know, I think a lot of times people come and approach this like, oh, my God, I have to pretend I know everything because if I don't, then no one will have confidence in me. But, uh, you know, I was like, well, all of these people know so much more about their jobs than I do about my job. This is my first time doing this as a director. But, you know, the lighting people know lighting way more than I would ever know about directing. So why not ask them? <laughs> hey, what's something that, you know, maybe I should know? And I was started to ask that throughout my career in every department and said, hey, what do you think I should know? And then having like someone like Danny Pudi, who's this fantastic actor who's been in like hundreds of episodes of television, you know, working with so many directors. I literally told Danny, I said, hey, think of all the good directors you've worked with. Like, what do they have in common? And so I'll learn from you telling yeah. me what you were doing. And he, he would tell me, he would say, you know, they, do. and then, so that was great because I would, I would be able to check in and say, you know, Danny, am I doing this right? Like, is this how you're, you know, cause he, he knows like the, those actors are so talented and so experienced that they understand. So if you're going to come to set and sort of bullshit them, like sort of pretend, you know, more than you do, they're going to sniff that out immediately. And, and then yeah. there's the trust. And I think the, the more important thing is to be honest and say, look, I don't know a lot of these things. And, and I was just worried that the record button wasn't on. So, I'll <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think that's true. I think a lot of times I think people who love film and are on the outside and haven't made many films themselves, they think of it as like, you know, you have a Scorsese or a Spielberg or, oh my God, clearly they knew what they were doing. And there are some filmmakers out there who would totally lie to you. And then, but I don't think they're, I, those two examples I use, and I know David Fincher said this as well. He's like, oh, no, 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 it's a mess. The whole process is a mess. And I, it's, I mean, it, it makes me, it makes me happy to hear that. Cause I feel like I've heard a lot of directors say that is it's like, it's not about going in there and just being a complete like dick. You have to go in there with an open mind and you have to be willing to collaborate. But it sounds like that was pretty much your experience as you really were like, teach me. Well, take a look at yourself. Like you're very, um, you're a big fan of film, right? And you know what you like in film, what you don't like in film. That core competency is really important. And when you when you go and do your first film, if you do a film, you're basically going to go out there and remove that core competency and say, well, I'm going to be this. You know, the competency you don't have, you focus on. Whereas what's really magical is the fact that you have this great taste and so if you're saying let me just focus on that i know what i like <laughs> i know what i don't like you know i'll just focus on that part that part i can control i know what i think is funny and i know what i think is not funny so i'll just focus on that and i'll let the people around me on my team um do the things that they're so good at so like i'm not going to sit there and wonder what light we're using to get this 
specific thing. That's not my, you know, that's not what, that's not what I'm supposed to be doing anyways. I'm going to look at like, Hey, is this line the best way I'm going to work with my actors? I'm going to do the things that I can control and let, you know, talented people do the rest and trusting them is really important. So it's also who you hire. Like I started with this great producer who Valerie Steinberg, she's so fantastic at hiring. And so that when I'm, when I'm on set, I just know all of these people are just very good at what they do. Um, so yeah, I know asking questions is amazing. Like it really does help you because what you do is you start to learn from people who are so passionate. Like we had a choreographer on our, um, on our set and I have no idea like, uh, about. Right. And by the way, uh, to the audience, there's, there's just, it's a, there's a dance number in this. Cause why not? It's your first yeah. film. It's a short film. Why not have a dance, a burning building, a, a dance routine? Why not? Just throw it yeah. all in there. Yeah, and you just learn and you start to go, oh wow, you know what, you're working with the you're working with people who have dedicated their lives to their passion. So why not just like listen to them? And I think that that was really helpful and I learned a lot from everything. I was like, oh, that's why they do this and oh, that's why they do that. You know, so like a little film school in a way. Was there any other job that you were like, if I wasn't directing this, this is I think what I would love to do? Like a job on the set or job? Yeah, like a, like you know, director of photography. Uh, is there any role that you saw yourself in where you were thinking like, ah, oh, that might be fun to try out someday? Or where you're like, nope, directing's good. I'm good with that. Oh, the directing is great. You know, there's a couple of roles that I looked at on, on my set. And I said, wow, those people deserve so much more credit than they get. Like sound. You know, you're holding a boom constantly. You know, your arms, you're basically following. You're doing this amazing job. Make sure you don't have any shadows on your mic. You're trying to get the audio. And at the end of a take, you know, it's always like, let's go to the cameras. Let's look at how it looked. And really, at the end of the day, if the audio isn't there, we got nothing anyway. And the sound, the sound person's basically saying, oh, we had, a, we had an airplane that had to, so we, <laughs> we do that take. And everyone's celebrating this great take. And, you know, they're the ones who have to tell you, like, hey, the sound. So, you know, at the beginning, I told the sound person, I said, uh, you know, you're just as important as the DP because you are. If the selling isn't there, we're, we're a mess. We can't ADR all this stuff. So you, you're going to have to tell me. And I think that, you know, sound is, is, is never considered uh, the same, but it's really, really difficult. And I have a lot of empathy for, for people who do it because it's, it's hard to do really Dude, well. I, I had to hold a boom mic up for maybe a 30 minute interview. And it is, exhausting it's exhausting just in that little bit of experience i gained so much respect because and you realize like especially like steady cam operators like like our camera operators but boom operators you realize why they're so built because you have to have that strength to hold that boom pole for however yeah. many takes and however long like a 10 hour day it's exhausting but it uh, is so it seems like, so coffee shop names, the, the inception of it, obviously you kind of were like, well, I, I, I can sense the germ of the idea is you yourself going into a shop and being like, nobody knows how to say Deepak. What is this? And then saying, that's a funny idea for like a sketch, like something like that. I feel like that. When did you make the jump into coming up with like, was it an easy jump to be like, well, what if I just showcased like, oh, Deepak is Derek and uh, Derek is uh, an airline pilot. Like, it, how easy was it to make that leap creatively to showcase their imaginations of what their fake names would be? I started doing it on stand-up. Like, if I was in between a bit, I would ask the audience, you know, what's, what's your Starbucks name? I thought that was funny because I would get a laugh out of whatever their, their name was, you know? And so that, to me, made me laugh because you hear these people who have, relatively easy to pronounce names and they still have Starbucks names. And I thought that was funny because it was more of a persona. Like I, I'm so intrigued by the moment that you have to choose your online name for something. <laughs> like, I know everyone's like, Oh, I'll just put this, but then I go like, wait, let's stop for a second. Why did you choose that name? Why are like, cause then you start realizing in their mind, they think they're like some warrior or something like that they've used, you know? And so you start to sort of tap in on like their secret dreams <laughs> and stuff like that. And I think that's funny. Because we never have a moment where we just stop and we go, why did you pick that alias? That's not you at all. And I think that's really funny that we always pick these aliases. Because like, you know, it, it goes, I never, let me just preface this by saying I never thought of this while writing it. But now I look back and I start going, 
oh, you know, we, we, we live in this world of aliases where, you know, you don't have any sort of um, accountability for what you say online, but it's shielded by this anonymous alias. Right. And it's like a superhero in a way you get to go and beneath the cloak of night, just trash people <laughs> and then and then come back and live your life and pretend that you're a good person. But really right. what you're doing is just destroying someone uh, that you just barely had some sort of negative reaction to some of their work or whatever it is or a restaurant you went to that didn't give you enough ponzu sauce and now you're like, <laughs> bam, let me get them, you know, uh, with my <laughs> avatar that no one knows it's me. And, and but, but really, at the end of the day, what, what are we doing except sort of uh, exercising a, a, an element of ourselves, a, a, a sort of a sleeve of who we are? And I thought that was really interesting. And I think with coffee shop names, we we tend to do we tend to do that, and we tend to sort of have an attachment to our coffee shop names, and so I think it's just an interesting sort of way to do it. And I said, oh, you know, for a short film, it's, it's good. I think for something longer, it might be harder to do, but yeah. yeah so that's what, but that's where it came from. So who who are you? Are you a, are you a Scott? Are you a Rachel? <laughs> which which persona do do you? Are you the airline pilot, or are you the one with the independent bookshop dancing around? I would love, I think I'm all three of them in a way, but, but really to me, uh, I actually used Derek and really they did change the name one day and they, I wrote Derek the two R's. And I love that you like, were so into it that you were like, no, 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 it's D E R E K. Yeah. How dare you? Like, that's how committed you are with it. Yeah. And then I realized, why am I upset? I wasn't, by the way, just uh, for people at home, I wasn't like actually upset like outwardly uh i was just in my mind though like oh, i'm not a derek with two r's i'm a derek with a d-e-r-e-k like that's the fake persona i've been using for 20 years how did they they mess that up for me i mean not 20 years you know i just like to I, uh, <laughs> so I was gonna say, say, that, this years. is this is the commitment to the bit is perfect <laughs> just commit say yes 20 yeah, years i've been perfect. doing it yeah I, I can't even drink coffee at that time but but yeah <laughs> you know, you're basically you're you're saying um that you're attached to this persona and you're it's funny it's funny that we're attached to these things and i think that was the whole point and uh and yeah airline pilot or airline sorry yeah pilot because i always thought back in the day pilots were like so friendly they would talk to people and now you never see them you know you see yeah. them and so i'm like oh this pilot would just be someone to talk to people you know they come out and you'd be like how's everyone doing like that pilot like we don't have like going down the aisles and yeah high fives up and down we're gonna have a great flight (laughs) i think i'd be freaked out if that happened now you're like oh my god i would not blame you i would be too uh which one was the most fun to shoot like which one i I imagine i mean it's all exhausting but when you were finally able to cut it together was there one you were able to be like that's pretty cool that we were able to pull that off um, I think the fire was fun. I thought it was going to be harder than it was, you know, having a fire in the middle of, of the day and all that. But um, the the dance was just so, like, amazing to do. I love musicals. Like you said, um, that, you know, watching a musical is important, right, to see it. And then, you know, I think that was just so much fun to, to, to do, to actually see, you know, the people who put in the work, the choreographer, the dancers, like just everyone just do it. You know, Kasser Muhammad, who plays uh, Rachel, uh, her coffee shop name, Rachel, she sang that song. She danced. She learned how to sort of do the moves and she did it all. And so for me, it was very, um, I just sat back and <laughs> watched the screen. I was like, oh, great. I noticed in terms of pacing, I, I, I noticed like you had to speed up some of it. Was there like a part of you that was like, damn, I wish I could have had this whole thing in there. And then by extension, was there anything else you had to cut out that you really wish you could have kept in the film? That was the darling, you know, with Killing Your Darling. That was the one where yeah. I was like, you know, I, I wish I didn't have to forward it, but it just felt very much like it wasn't specific. It was too, it was a little too long for like the pattern that I was trying to go for. Um, but yeah, it was such a great thing to have that all done and, and all be there. It was just, uh, it was it was the only thing that really that we had to cut down. I wish I had more of Karen Sony's jokes because he brought so many of them, but uh, it just it was like it would have just went so long on that side. And then Anders Home from Workaholics, who's such a fantastic mm-hmm. act, you know, he gave me so much stuff that's really funny. I didn't get to use all of it, but it was it was it was great to just watch him work. And was this something where you thought? Uh sometimes people will make a short film as the means it almost as a stepping stone. Like sometimes somebody will take a a scene from a script they've written, like a feature and they'll make a short and they'll say, Hey, 
they'll yeah. kind of use it as a selling point or like a pitch or a calling card to be like, look, I can direct. How about we make this into a feature? Did you have that in mind when you were making this? Were you thinking, oh, because obviously it's very self-contained and it's obviously a one-off sketch, but was there a part of you that was thinking, I want to make this partially not only to prove myself as a director, but maybe to expand this into something else, like maybe take these characters and do something else with them, like an office type thing? Mm -hmm. Or was there anything in the back of your mind like that? Or I guess this is a long way of asking what are your, your plans? Do you want to do more directing? Do you want to do features and things like that? And where are you planning on going next? Well, well no, you know, what's funny, it was a, it was sort of a little bit I had on my standup and then it's turned into a short. So I never really thought of it as more than that. But as I sort of reflect on it and sort of writing sort of ideas, I mean, the, what, what, I'd, what would be kind of interesting is if those three uh, Indian people who are the, the, the people in the short uh, had, you know, used that coffee shop as sort of like a WeWork space, you know, like I think that's kind of interesting. So, so that was an idea that was sort of talked about that I thought was kind of interesting. But then another way to do it would be to take one person, because I've had this as well, mm -hmm. and take all of their coffee shop names, because I have more than Derek, you know? I don't want to brag. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I have Dennis sometimes, every once in a while, if I'm feeling nice. Dennis. Nice. You know, I got that. And so then I would just say, it'd be funny if you take one person, and you show their lives as they went through the coffee shop names, you know? Like well, living the dual Dennis, lives? <laughs> like a scanner darkly, where you're living, you think you're living one life, and you're actually living another life. Yeah, like Walter Mitty, to me, uh, that was where, like, I was like, oh, if it's a little bit of Walter Mitty, then that's great, because Walter Mitty was so much more about this imagination that sort of popped in and out of it. I thought that was great. But, you know, one person having different coffee shop names throughout their life could be funny if you really do it that way. But, you know, no one's going to take that that seriously, because it's like a coffee shop name. But what if you did kind of like kind of seriously? I was going through this when I had Dennis, and then I was like this when I was Derek. You know, <laughs> this just occurred to me. I never, I didn't even think to ask you this beforehand. What would my coffee shop name be? But flip it. Give me an Indian name. We've only known each other. We've been talking for 30, 40 minutes. What What do you think based well, you on our short conversation? Seamlessly move like uh, go to India because Sean S H A A N. That's a popular name. Perfect. So you're already that was, was planned. I planned it that way. <laughs> you're already there. Although I don't know how much coffee you're drinking in India. <laughs> yeah, I feel like uh, Sean is a is a really. There's a couple of Indian names that are so perfectly like Dave. You know, Dave Patel is like Dave, which is mm. D E V, and that's Dave. So that kind of works. J J Preet is J. Sean S A A N Sean. So right. you got all that. You're ahead of the curve. I think your parents did a great job in the uh, <laughs> casting department. I'll tell them you said that. So, uh, what do you what do you want to do next? I mean, like more directing, more writing. Like, wh what are your uh, next projects? What do you have lined up? Yeah, I want to um, I want to continue to write things that are interesting to me. I like things that are in the zeitgeist. I feel like I love I love characters that are underdogs that are scrappy. And I love characters that are underdogs that are um, going through tough times. So I feel like the next thing I write is going to be coming out of the pandemic. You know, what happens in this world of, of new, you know, for me, the pandemic served as a catalyst for the characters that are all of us, you know, like this is the sort of moment where we reflect on our lives and we go, what can we do coming out of this? So I feel like you're going to see a lot of stories that are characters that are coming out of this thing. And, you know, what do they do differently? You know, are they discovering their passion? Are they trying to do something that's different for the first time? Or have they self-reflected in a way? You know, that to me is, is where I, I'm interested in that. Um, I love that, yeah. I also like uh, Indian characters, uh, South Asian characters, I feel like uh, have this, we, our stories haven't really been told as much. And so I want to I wanna tell those stories. And also like I'm Canadian, so I love the Canadian accents. So I'd love to find a character that can can sound like many of the people I grew up with. I think those are that's my dream. Dude, I'd love to see that. That's a great idea too. And you feel like I'm my eyes, I can already feel them glazing over whenever I read a story about like I think uh Anne, Anne Hathaway is gonna star in the new Netflix pandemic inspired film Bye. or something like so I'm just kinda like, oh my god. But that pitch right there, that to me 
sounds so much fun in such a like natural organic way without having it be like oh it's now the hip new thing to do but i i love that idea yeah like i remember hearing so 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 for example if someone told me like they're a, uh they're an accountant they've been an accountant for like 10 years and now they want to practice magic and i said you know the only the pandemic <laughs> can can cause that shift and that's to me so intriguing because now someone has told me like, oh, their dream has literally been to be a magician and they just never figured out. And then the, the world sort of uh, stopped for a second and they said, oh, I want to be a magician. So I am always intrigued by like near death experiences because I think near death experiences gives you this like 360 sort of um, rota rotational camera around your life. And you're just going, oh, wow, I, I should have done that. And this sort of allowed us to all sort of have that. Uh, sort of reflection point and you go oh I wanted to do this and I've always wait I wasted my time doing this and so to me coming out all these stories are going to be so interesting mm -hmm. you know I hope hopefully writers from across the world who didn't even realize they wanted to write would have used this to say oh I'm going to write my story and now we get this influx of like authentic stories i mean i hope that that's the way it goes last question for you so uh my podcast missing frames we watch all the movies we should have seen by this point in our lives what is the movie you know you need to have seen that you still haven't but it, it's on your watch list that's a good one i just i just watched million dollar baby for the first time <laughs> i still haven't i haven't seen it how was oh, it my god oh really uh, do you like shawshank redemption i do love it I love Shawshank. And so, yeah, why? Well, it's just, it was on Netflix. And I said, oh my God, I, I might be the only one that's in this. I got to watch this. So I watched it. I was like, oh, wow. And it has this like element of Shawshank in it. It's got like that sort of the same sort of level of, of storytelling. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. I that's was, high praise. Shawshank is like, it's high up there. Yeah. Well, I think Million Dollar Baby might have won the Oscar. I have no idea. I don't remember. But, but it did. Uh, it did. You're right. Um, it has that on Shawshank because Shawshank didn't win anything. <laughs> the Million yeah. Dollar Baby. We just figured it out. Million Dollar Baby, I think, is the greatest movie ever made. Did we just decide that? <laughs> and then there's a movie. I'm sorry, this doesn't answer your question, but but this is the Kajillionaire, which I'm so excited to watch. Uh, Miranda July, who I love. I love Miranda July. I think she's such a fantastic writer. She's one of those people who you just just amazed by because you know she's like okay i did a film i'm just gonna write a novel now and then she writes a novel and it's great you know like oh and then she's like i'm just gonna write a book of short stories and you're like wait you could just do that that's cool <laughs> that's the dream yeah that's the dream like, man. Oh, it's a big budget film and she does kajillionaire and I'm like, oh wow just fantastic just that's the type of thing where you know I, i've heard an interview of her and she said that she wants to be a newbie at whatever she's doing like constantly over and over again and so that's why she's like i'm gonna be a novelist new to this i'm gonna be new to the big budget film i'm being new to independent film i'm like that is so cool i mean it's just it's awesome well deepak i really i really really hope you stick with and like do more writing do more directing because i'd love to see what else you have in that head of yours let's get that covid drama comedy <laughs> out there let's do it i really appreciate it thank you